Hello and welcome to Profdale's Property Video number 25. I'm your host, Dale Whitman. In this video, we're going to consider transfers of tenants' and landlords' interests when real property is subject to a lease. Let's think for a minute about what interests landlords and tenants have to transfer. Both of them have legal interests that they can transfer. In the case of the landlord, the landlord has two interests that can be sold or transferred. The first one is called rents, namely the right to get the rent from the tenant. And in our legal system, the right to rents is considered an interest in real property. So it can be transferred by an ordinary deed. The other interest the landlord has is the reversion. That's a future interest. It's the right to get the property back in possession again when the lease terminates. In the case of a tenant, the tenant only has one interest that can be sold or transferred. It's the leasehold or non-freehold interest. Normally in commercial leases, it's a fixed term leasehold estate. Now most of this video is concerned with transfers by tenants, but we will cover transfers by landlords at the end of the video. Let's think for a minute about transfers by tenants. Tenants, as we mentioned, have only one interest to transfer, namely the leasehold estate. But there are two different ways that a tenant can make a transfer of that leasehold interest. The first way is by making an assignment. And in an assignment, the tenant doesn't hold anything back. The tenant's entire interest is transferred to the new owner of that interest. The other way that a tenant can make a transfer is by a sublease. And in a sublease, the tenant does hold something back, namely some portion of the remaining term of the lease. So what that means is that the possession of the property will come back to the original tenant after the sublease is over for some limited period of time until the master lease ends. Now it's critical in landlord-tenant law to be able to tell whether a particular transfer by a tenant is an assignment or a sublease. So we'll do a little practicing on those. But before we do, let's consider how to diagram these kinds of cases. There's a tremendous amount of power in making a good diagram of a case. It'll help you keep the parties and the facts straight, and I strongly urge you to do it. You'll notice in this example, there's a diagram showing a lease from the landlord to tenant one, and then an assignment or a sublease from tenant one to tenant two. Now, I don't like to be overbearing about this, but do it my way. Diagram the transaction by showing the original landlord-tenant relationship as a horizontal arrow, and then transfers by the original landlord or tenant to a new party as vertical arrows. If you'll do that, it will help you terrifically in keeping the facts and the parties straight. Now let's engage in a little practice in distinguishing between assignments and subleases. We'll assume that T1, the original tenant, has a five-year term remaining on the original lease. At that point, T1 gives T2 a three-year term. So that means that after three years have gone by, T2 will have to give up possession, and T1 will get possession again for the last two years of the term of the master lease. That transfer, of course, is a sublease because T1 has given up less than the entire remaining term of the lease. On the other hand, if there's five years left to go on the lease and T1 gives T2 the full five-year term, that transaction is an assignment. Now, here's a kind of a quirky example. T1 gives T2 a five-year term. That would normally be an assignment, but T1 reserves a right of entry. What do we mean by, by a right of entry? We mean that T1, under certain conditions, can re-enter and take back the estate that T2 was given and terminate T2's estate. Why would T1 want to do that? Well, the answer is that if T2 fails to pay the rent on the master lease, the landlord might come back and sue T1 for that delinquent rent. And if T1 had to pay that rent, T1 would understandably be very unhappy about it and T1 might want to take back the lease property and use it for the remaining term of the lease in order to get some economic value to compensate T1 for the loss that T1 incurred by having to pay the rent that T2 really should have paid. Well, that's why T1 might want to exercise a right of entry, but that still leaves us with the original question. Does putting in the right of entry change it from an assignment 
to a sublease? Well, the answer is that it's just a purely technical question and the case law is split just about 50-50 on it, so it might go either way. By the way, there's one thing you ought to watch out for anytime there's an assignment or a sublease, and that is the statute of frauds. In most states, the statute of frauds applies to a conveyance of an interest that's longer than exactly one year. So that means if T1 is giving T2 an assignment or a sublease that's going to last longer than one year, it better be in writing or else the court might say that that transfer is ineffective because it didn't comply with the statute of frauds. Now here's an interesting question. Would T2, the new tenant, be willing to pay some money in order to receive an assignment or a sublease? Well, the answer depends on whether the lease has a bonus value. And by a bonus value, what we mean is that the fair market rent for the property is higher than the contract rent, contract rent being the actual rent called for in the lease. In other words, the property is worth more than you have to pay in order to rent it. Now, let's see how that might work in real life. Assume that there's a five-year remaining term on the lease, and let's assume the contract rent for the property, the rent called for in the lease, is $1,000 a month. However, the property is worth $1,100 a month, an extra $100 a month over and above the contract rent. Why would the fair market rent be higher than the contract rent? Well, you can think of a couple of possible reasons. One possibility is that the tenant was just a very effective negotiator when the lease was signed and convinced the landlord to rent the property for less than its fair market value. That isn't too likely, but it could happen. A more likely explanation is that market rents have gone up since the lease was signed. However, there's no corresponding rent escalation clause in the lease. Therefore, the contract rent under the lease remains the same even if the market rent has gone up. By the way, that's a pretty common scenario in which property is now worth more in terms of fair rental value than the rent called for in the lease. Well, now, if we conclude that the lease has a bonus value, we can actually put a dollar amount on it. Again, let's assume the rent is $1,000 a month. And the fair market rent is $1,100 a month. That means that there's a bonus value to the tenant of $100 a month, and that bonus value is going to accrue every month for five years. If the lease is assigned or transferred at this point, the new tenant will get that benefit of $100 a month for the next five years. So to convert that to a lump sum present value, we use either a financial calculator or a present value table in a set of financial tables and we have to assume some interest or discount rate. So let's assume a nice round number like 6%. And we conclude that the present value of $100 a month for the next five years is $5,172. What that means is that if you put that amount of money, $5,172, in a savings account that earns 6% interest, and you took out $100 every month, after 60 months, the account would be exhausted. All the money would have been taken out of the account. So the $5,172 is simply the present value of the right to have $100 a month benefiting you for the next five years or 60 months. So this is about what a new tenant would be willing to pay in order to get a transfer, in this case an assignment, since it would be for the full remaining term, of that lease. And this is actually a very realistic uh, cal calculation that a new tenant would engage in in order to decide what to pay to receive an assignment of the lease. Why do tenants assign or sublease their property? Well, there are lots of possible reasons. They might need to move in order to get more space because their business has been successful and they've run out of space. They might be dissatisfied with the premises for various reasons. It might not be a good location for their business, for example. They might be able to make a profit by selling their bonus value to a new tenant. So that might be an added incentive to the original tenant in making an assignment or a sublease as they can get some cash out of it. How do they collect on this cash? 
Well, there are several possible methods. One way is they could charge a lump sum front end fee to T2. T2 could simply pay cash for an assignment or a sublease. Alternatively, T2 might agree to pay an override on the future rent. That is, T2 would pay the original rent perhaps to the landlord and then an additional amount every month back to T1. It might also be a combination of these two methods where T2 pays some amount up front and pays some amount as an override on the future rent. Any of those are possibilities. Now we've already said that it's important to be able to tell whether a transfer by the original tenant is an assignment or a sublease, but we haven't explained why that's true, and we can't give a full explanation of that until the next video. But one reason that we can't understand now is that there might be a clause in the lease that prohibits either assignments or subleases, but doesn't prohibit both of them. So we need to be able to tell whether the particular transfer we're looking at is an assignment or a sublease in order to tell whether it's prohibited or not. There are a couple of other reasons. For example, the landlord might seek to enforce a rent covenant or other covenants made by the original tenant against T2, or it might be the other way around. T2 might seek to enforce covenants that were made by the original landlord. Now we're going to study number two and number three in the next video, that's video number 26, about covenants running with landlords and tenants' interests in the land. So you'll need to hold off for a little while and review that video in order to understand fully why we need to be able to distinguish between assignments and subleases. What might the lease say about assignments or subleases? Well, one possibility is that it will say nothing at all. What's the effect if the lease simply doesn't mention assignments or subleases? The answer is that it's perfectly okay for the tenant to make an assignment or a sublease. They don't need the landlord's consent or approval. In fact, they don't even need to tell the landlord about it. Literally, they can just go ahead and do it. However, most leases do say something about assignments and subleases. One possibility is the lease might say they're simply prohibited. And what that means, of course, is you can't do it without going back to the landlord and seeing if the landlord will waive that prohibition. Another possibility is the lease will expressly say that assignments and or subleases are prohibited unless the landlord consents. That's a very common kind of clause to find in a lease. Another possibility is that assignments and subleases are prohibited unless the landlord consents, but the landlord won't unreasonably withhold consent. Now again, you find that quite frequently in leases, but I'd suggest that it's not very good drafting because it leaves the parties to argue later about whether the landlord has been reasonable or unreasonable. So it's much better for, to have the landlord expressly say in the original lease what the basis would be for the landlord's withholding consent. These statements, as we've indicated, might apply to assignments or to subleases or to both of them. Does a prohibition on one, for example, assignments, prohibit the other, for example, subleases? And the answer is no, they're different animals and a prohibition on one doesn't cover the other one at all. So smart landlords always say in the clause that covers assignments and subleases in the original lease that both of them are prohibited without the landlord's consent or something to that effect. Before we talk further about uh, assignments and subleases, we need to take a little excursion into the topic of restraints on alienation. In a few minutes, you'll see why this is important. It's because many times a restriction on assignments and subleases in a lease is in fact a restraint on alienation. In general, what do we mean by restraints on alienation? We mean a provision in a contract, a will, a deed, or a lease that purports to prevent the holder of an interest in the property from transferring it. In other words, it tries to restrain the owner from alienating or transferring his or her property. A restraint on alienation is usually inserted in a document that is a deed, a will, a contract, or a lease, to prevent the grantee or devisee, that is the person who is receiving the property, from retransferring it without the original grantor's consent. 
Traditionally, there are three types of restraints on alienation. Now, not every restraint on alienation fits neatly into one of these categories, but nevertheless, it is important to recognize and understand them. The first kind is called a promissory restraint. An example might be O owns the land and conveys it to A, but A promises, or the word might be covenants or agrees, not to transfer the land to anybody else without, without O's written approval. That's a promissory restraint. A second kind is a forfeiture restraint. Here, an example would be O conveys the land to A, but if A transfer the land to anybody else without O's written approval, O can re-enter and terminate the estate. Now you'll notice the difference between these two. In a promissory restraint, A says, I promise not to transfer it. In a forfeiture restraint, A says, if I do transfer it, the previous owner can come in and take it away from me, can take the land back for him or herself. The third kind of restraint is a disabling restraint. Basically, it says, if you try to transfer the land without my approval, it won't work, it won't transfer. An example might be 2A, but if A attempts to transfer the land to anybody else without O, the previous owner's written approval, the purported transfer will be null and void. Now notice carefully what this is saying. It's saying that A lacks the power to make a transfer of the land without O's written approval. If A tries to make a transfer, the transfer won't happen. It will be null and void. It will be as if it didn't occur. So it takes away from A the power to make a transfer. Courts vary in their attitude toward forfeiture and promissory restraints on fee simple estates. Some courts, for example, say they're simply void, that it's impossible to restrain the alienation of a fee simple estate. The court won't allow it to happen. Other courts say, no, we will allow it to happen if the restraint on alienation is reasonable. And that means the court then has to decide whether a particular restraint on alienation is reasonable or not. Reasonableness might be found from certain factors that we can identify. One of them is that the restraint is limited in the time that it's in effect. For example, it might be limited to the lifetime of one of the parties, either the grantor or the grantee, or it might be limited to a specific number of years. And if that number of years isn't too long, again, the court might find it to be reasonable and therefore might uphold the restraint on alienation. A second factor is the restraint on alienation might be limited in terms of the number of persons who are affected by it. For example, it might say, that no transfer is allowed to members of a specific family, but transfer to anybody else in the world is okay. The court might look at that and say, well, that's not a very severe restriction on the ability to transfer the property. Therefore, it's reasonable and will uphold that and enforce it. A third factor is the restraint might be limited to certain kinds of transfers. For example, the restraint might say that the grantee can sell the land, but is not permitted to put a mortgage on it. And a court might say, again, that's not a very severe restraint, just limits the ability to mortgage the property, and therefore will uphold that and consider it to be reasonable. Now, all of that deals with forfeiture and promissory restraints. On a disabling restraint, the story is different. Disabling restraints are always held void and unenforceable. In other words, you literally cannot take away from somebody the power to transfer their property. You can make them promise not to do it. You can take the land back from them if they do it, but you cannot withdraw from them the capacity to make a transfer of the property. Now we need to talk about how this doctrine of restraints on alienation applies to leasehold estates. If we have a lease term that prohibits assignments or subleases, is that a restraint on alienation? Well, obviously it is, because after all, an assignment or a sublease is a form of alienation or transfer of the property, and this is a lease term that stands in the way of doing so. However, the courts are much more lenient in enforcing these restraints when the estate being restrained is less than a fee simple.
For example, if the estate being restrained is a life estate or a leasehold estate, on these types of estates, promissory and forfeiture restraints are generally upheld. Now, they are strictly construed, so a restraint on assignments won't apply to subleases, a restraint on subleases won't apply to assignments, as we've already talked about. But nevertheless, in general, promissory and forfeiture restraints of the type that we've been talking about, if they apply to a leasehold estate, are generally upheld by the courts. So, so what that means is that lease clauses that prohibit assignments and subleases, if they're phrased as promissory or forfeiture restraints, are nearly always enforced by the courts. Remember, a disabling restraint is never enforced. I made a little chart showing the enforceability of restraints on alienation of the three types, promissory, forfeiture, and disabling, and how they apply to both fee simple estates and the leasehold estates. If you like, you can make a screen capture of the chart. I won't bother talking you through it because it simply restates the principles that we've already covered. But the bottom line here is pretty simple. The courts generally do enforce clauses in leases that give the landlord the right to consent to assignments and subleases. Now we're ready to go back and talk about how assignments and subleases are negotiated. Let's think about the rental arrangements that could be made when the parties make an assignment or a sublease. There are several possibilities. One possibility is that T2, the new tenant, could pay all of the original rent directly to the landlord, and that would be the only rent that, or payment that would be made on a monthly basis. In this case, we're assuming that there wouldn't be any override on the rent coming back to T1, the original tenant. A second possibility is that T2 could pay all of the original rent directly to the landlord, and any rent override could be paid directly to T1. A third possibility is that T2 could pay all the rent, including both the original rent and an override on the rent to T1, and then T1 would pay the original rent to the landlord. This arrangement is most common in subleases, but it could be done in an assignment as well. In deciding whether an assignment or a sublease has occurred, in other words, in deciding which of them it is, does it matter which way T2 pays the rent, directly to the landlord or to T1 who then pays the landlord? Well, the answer is no, that doesn't matter at all. That doesn't tell you anything about whether it's an assignment or a sublease. Does it matter whether the landlord has or has not expressly released T1, the original tenant, from liability? Once again, the landlord may or may not do that. It isn't automatic, but whether the landlord does it has no bearing whatsoever on whether we're looking at an assignment or a sublease. Does it matter whether the parties call it an assignment or a sublease? Well, the courts generally are perfectly willing to ignore what the parties call it if they give it the wrong name. And many times they do give it the wrong name because most landlords and most tenants don't know the difference between an assignment or a sublease. So the courts will look at the facts and determine whether it's an assignment or a sublease, even if the parties have called it the wrong name. Now, if the lease requires the landlord's consent to the tenant making an assignment or a sublease, what's the effect of an assignment or a sublease that's made without that consent? In other words, the tenant simply goes ahead and doesn't bother to get the landlord's consent, makes an assignment or a sublease anyway. First of all, does that violate a covenant in the lease? Well, if there is such a covenant, then this will certainly violate it. It's a breach of a lease covenant. Is the assignment therefore automatically void? Well, the answer is no, it's not automatically void at all. In fact, here's an answer from a court in Washington that constitutes really the best analysis of this situation. In Bellevue Square Managers, the court said the following. An assignment made in violation of a lease restriction is not void, but rather is good between the assignor and the assignee, subject to whatever rights the lessor may have. In other words, while an otherwise invalid assignment is valid, 
between the assignor and the assignee, it is nevertheless voidable by the landlord. Now, why and how would it be voidable? Well, the answer is the landlord will recognize when he finds out about the assignment or sublease that, it, that was given without his consent, he'll recognize that it breaches the lease. So the landlord can assert the normal remedies for breach of the lease by a tenant of a lease covenant. What are those normal remedies? Well, classically, they are either an, a claim for damages against the tenant or termination by the landlord of the lease itself. So the, the landlord might assert the following remedies. Lease termination, why? Well, either because there's a statute in the state that allows landlords to terminate for material breaches by tenants, or because the lease says the landlord can do that. However, you might ask, would the landlord always want to terminate the lease? And the answer is very possibly, the landlord will decide not to terminate the lease even if the landlord has the power to do so. The reason is that it may well be the assignment or sublease went to a new party who is perfectly acceptable. They're not doing anything objectionable. They're paying the rent every month. The landlord, if he terminates the lease, will have a vacancy. That means the landlord will have to fill the vacancy, and often that takes a significant amount of time. So the landlord might say, well, I have the power to terminate the lease because the tenant made this unconsented assignment or sublease, but I don't think it's really in my interest to exercise that power. The landlord would have to fill a vacancy and the new tenant, as we said, might be financially reliable and therefore perfectly acceptable as a tenant. What about claiming damages? Well, in theory, the landlord can do that, but the landlord would have to show some actual damage. If the new tenant is financially responsible, is paying the rent, is not doing anything objectionable on the property, then it may be very difficult for the landlord to prove any actual damages. What about an injunction? Could the landlord go to court and enjoin the tenant from making an unconsented assignment or sublease? The problem with that is that in, an injunction would make the restraint on alienation a disabling restraint. It would literally take away the power of the tenant to make an assignment or a sublease. And we all know that disabling restraints on alienation are never enforced by the court. So an injunction simply won't be available. That would make it a disabling restraint on alienation, which is strictly not allowed. Now let's go back to the discussion we were having of decision-making with regard to assignments and subleases. Does a landlord have to be reasonable if a landlord withholds consent under one of those clauses that we've been talking about? Well, traditionally, the answer to that question was no. The landlord didn't have to be reasonable. If the lease required landlord consent to an assignment or a sublease, the law said the landlord could arbitrarily withhold consent. And since the landlord could do that, the landlord might use the consent clause as leverage to get some money out of the tenant. The landlord might say, I'll give my consent, but only if you'll give me $1,000 or $2,000 or whatever figure the parties might agree on. But no reason had to be given for a denial of consent unless the lease required the landlord to be reasonable. In recent years, however, about 15 states have changed that. They've said that a landlord can deny consent only on a commercially reasonable basis. That's an important holding. It's still a minority view, but it's a significant one. Why would a landlord refuse consent to an assignment or a sublease? Well, one possibility is that the new tenant is commercially undesirable. They might be financially irresponsible, so the landlord is afraid that he'll have trouble collecting the rent from them. They might want to make a use of the premises that's detrimental. For example, they might want to use it for some illegal purpose or some obnoxious purpose that would be bad for other nearby tenants of the same landlord. They might even propose a use that conflicts with the other tenants. They might, for example, open a business that is in competition with the business that's already being run by one of the landlord's other tenants.
They might want to make objectionable alterations in the property or put up signage or lighting that the landlord doesn't like. You can think of lots of reasons that are commercially undesirable. On the other hand, the landlord might have personal or idiosyncratic objections. The landlord might simply say, you want to transfer this land to X and I don't like X. I've had dealings with X in the past and I simply don't want to deal with them anymore. So I'm saying no to this assignment or sublease. Finally, the landlord might want to capture the increased rental value of the premises. In other words, if the lease has bonus value, the landlord might use this clause as a form of leverage to get some or all of that increased rental value, that bonus value for himself. Traditionally, that was a major reason for restrictions on assignments and subleases. That is to allow the landlord to capture some or all of the lease's bonus value when a transfer occurred. Now let's assume the landlord is required to be reasonable either because the lease terms require reasonableness or because the property is in one of those states where the courts have decided the landlord must be commercially reasonable if the landlord withholds consent to an assignment or a sublease. Can the landlord withhold consent as leverage in order to capture the bonus value of the lease? In other words, is that a reasonable basis for withholding consent? Well, the answer the courts have generally given is, if the landlord has to be reasonable, then the landlord can use the clause to capture the bonus value of the lease only if the lease clause specifically permits the landlord to do so. So landlords now, in particularly in those 15 states, include clauses like that in their form leases. What would such a clause look like? Well, you can think of several possible ways the clause might read. Let's take a look at some. The first kind is simply a rent increase clause. It says the tenant may not assign or sublet without landlord's prior written consent, which landlord may withhold unless the assignee or subtenant agrees to adjust the rent to the landlord to current fair rental value. So that means the landlord will capture the bonus value of the lease under that clause. A second clause is the profit sharing clause. It says in the event the tenant assigns or sublets for a higher rent or a lump sum payment, the landlord is entitled to receive an equivalent sum from the tenant, or perhaps only half or two thirds if the landlord isn't too greedy of an equivalent sum from the tenant. Again, the landlord is capturing the bonus value or some part of it with a clause like this. Finally, a recapture clause which says in the event the tenant proposes to assign or sublet, the landlord is instead entitled to terminate the lease and enter into a similar or same transaction directly with the proposed new tenant. And of course, the new lease may be for a, high, a higher rent, and that means the landlord will in effect have captured the bonus value of the lease. Now, when the landlord's consent is requested, the landlord might want to impose some conditions on giving that consent. Is the landlord entitled to review the actual document, the proposed sublease or assignment, before deciding whether to grant consent? Obviously, that would be eminently reasonable of the landlord. In fact, it would be almost careless of the landlord to fail to do it. What other evidence can the landlord review? Well, could the landlord, for example, require as a condition of consent to the assignment that T2, the new tenant, furnish information on T2's financials and T2's experience in running this type of business so the landlord can judge whether T2 would be an acceptable and reliable subtenant or assignee. Could the landlord demand that T2 assume personal liability on the lease so that T2 would be personally liable for the rent and every other covenant in the lease? Once again, eminently reasonable perfectly sensible for the landlord to demand that. Could the landlord even demand that T2's principles, and by principles, we mean if T2 is an LLC, for example, that the owners of the LLC could also assume personal liability on the lease. In other words, guarantee the payment of the rent under the lease. Once again, perfectly reasonable, I would say, 
for the landlord to demand that sort of assurance. Let's assume that we have a lease that requires the landlord's consent to assignments and subleases, but either the lease itself or state law requires the landlord to be reasonable. And let's also assume the landlord gives an unreasonable basis for withholding consent or re simply refuses to consent without being reasonable at all. What are the tenant's remedies? Can the tenant recover damages? Well, definitely the answer here is yes. We could measure those damages in terms of how much it harms the tenant's business for the tenant not to be able to carry out the assignment or the sublease. Could the tenant terminate the lease because the landlord has acted unreasonably? Well, unfortunately, in most cases, the answer to that is no, because under the doctrine of independence of covenants, a tenant generally can't terminate a lease because of a material breach by a landlord. Now, there are a few states that have changed that, as we talked about on a previous video, but in most states, the tenant wouldn't have any power to terminate the lease. Could the tenant get an injunction in which the court would order the landlord to consent on the ground that there is no reasonable basis to withhold consent? Or alternatively, could the tenant get a declaratory judgment that the assignment or sublease is not subject to reasonable disapproval by the landlord because it would be unreasonable for the landlord to withhold consent and therefore that no landlord consent is required? Well, either of those last two, I would say, is a real live possibility. Remember that in most states, state law doesn't require landlords to be reasonable in withholding consent to an assignment or sublease. Only about 15 states, a minority view, have held that. Nevertheless, bear in mind that the lease itself may require the landlord to be reasonable, and that's just as effective as if state law did so. Now, at the beginning of the video, I promised you that at the end, we would cover transfers by landlords, and that's what we're going to do now. When a landlord assigns the lease, we call it selling the property subject to the lease. It's an ordinary outright sale of the real estate, and it's normally carried out with an ordinary deed. The deed will effectively transfer the landlord's rents and reversion interests to the new owner of the real estate. The landlords normally will sell their entire interest. They don't hold anything back. So there isn't anything in landlord transfers that's analogous to subleases by tenants. Transfers by landlords are virtually always straight assignments of the leases. Now, as we will see in the next video, both the benefits and the burdens of covenants in the lease will attach to the new owner automatically if they touch and concern the land. By touch and concern the land, we mean they have something to do with the real estate. So the new landlord will be liable for the burdens of the covenants that were made by the old landlord. In addition, the new landlord will have standing to enforce the benefits of covenants that were made by the tenants to the old landlord. So both the benefits and the burdens will transfer to the new owner if they touch and concern the land. However, in commercial sale transactions, it's common for the old landlord to also, in addition to the deed, execute an assignment of rents and leases as part of the sale process. And that document will transfer specifically the benefits of all the lease covenants that were made by the tenant to the old landlord will transfer those benefits to the new landlord. In addition, it'll provide for the purchaser who is buying the property to assume the burdens of lease covenants that were made by the old landlord to the tenants. So that will work even for covenants that don't touch and concern the land. The beauty of having a separate assignment of leases and rents is that it eliminates any concern about whether a particular covenant touches and concerns the land. All the benefits and all the burdens of all the covenants will transfer to the new landlord if we have one of those assignments of rents and leases. There's one last issue that we want to talk about for a moment, and that is when the old landlord makes a sale of the property, does the old landlord continue thereafter to be liable for the lease covenants that were made in the original leases? By analogy to the material on transfers by tenants, we'd say the answer to that should be yes. We already know that when a tenant makes an assignment or a sublease, 
the tenant remains liable on the covenants that the tenant made in the lease. And therefore, we'd logically say the same thing would be true on the landlord's side. The landlord would continue to be liable. In fact, the case law on this question is split just about 50-50. The cases that don't hold the old landlord to continue to be liable would say something like this. The old landlord is parted with all interest in the property and therefore has no control over breaches of covenants made by the new landlord. And it's quite unfair to hold somebody liable for breaches of covenants that they have no control of. So the case law is divided just about equally 50-50 on that question. That wraps up video 25 on assignments and subleases. In our next video, number 26, we'll talk about covenants running with landlords and tenants' interests when they're transferred. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.